Okay, so thanks everyone. So I'm going to be talking a bit about our, our work in tsunamis in Australia and uh, especially get, trying to get a nationally consistent view of the hazard from distant earthquakes. So the way the talk's going to go is, first of all, I'm going to give you a bit of background on tsunamis and um, observations of tsunamis in Australia. Okay, so of course most of you probably have never worked on tsunamis before. I'll give you enough background to follow the talk. Then I'm going to spend most of the talk talking about the uh, 2018 Australian Probabilistic Tsunami Hazard Assessment. So this is a study we, we released last year trying to quantify tsunami hazards around Australia. I'll talk about what it provides and then um, how we create these products and the testing that we perform of them. Um, and then talk a bit about the results and how you access those results if you're doing tsunami hazard studies. Okay, so first of all, a bit of an introduction to tsunamis. This is a, an image of a simulation of the, the maximum water level caused by the 2011 Japan tsunami, which probably most of you remember. And so tsunamis, uh, you can find records of them all throughout history, and there are some great databases around which try and capture as many events as we're aware of. So the most extensive one is the NOAA NGDC database, which is depicted here. So this is a plot of um, tsunami sources, okay? So the um, locations where a tsunami was generated, and if it's a big event, it might have propagated all throughout the ocean, but this is where they originate from. What you can also see on this plot is some lines, and they're defining plate tectonic boundaries, okay? So what you can immediately see is that most of the points on this plot are orange, so they correspond to earthquakes. And you can also see that they're certainly not randomly distributed. Most of them are clustered around some of these plate tectonic boundaries. And the boundaries uh, which they're clustered around are uh, places where the, the plates are converging with respect to each other, okay? So mostly subduction zones. This is places where one plate is being subducted under the other. And those are the areas that host the largest earthquakes that we see on Earth. So in this database, 83% of the events are from earthquakes. Um, you can also have tsunamis generated by other sources, so landslides. We saw a couple of big events in the last year in Indonesia generated by landslides. Volcanoes, other things, asteroids, even meteorological processes. But most of the big ones uh, originate from earthquakes. Okay, so how's it work? This plot that you see here um, is kind of like a, a cross-section through a subduction zone. And so you've got the, the Indian Ocean depicted there and uh, a plate that's uh, converging and being subducted under the Sumatra plate in this case, so the overriding plate. And this is going on all the time and it causes strain and stress to be build, built up around the subduction zone. And so eventually that becomes too great and you get an earthquake. And so what um, tends to happen for a typi typical subduction thrust earthquake is that you have um, that upper plate slipping forwards kind of towards the ocean and uh, uh, the opposite relative motion in the downward plate. And so that doesn't just cause motion along the fault, the entire area around um, the fault is deformed. And important for us for tsunamis is the way the, the uplift or subsidence of the ground, okay? Because if, uh, if that's um, under the ocean, it's going to lift up or subside the ocean too and disturb the gravitational equilibrium. Something that you don't see in this plot on the left here is that um, often the slip for earthquakes is quite spatially variable, okay? So this has some important effects on tsunamis. This picture here is showing in green a representation of um, the subduction zone near Japan. And the coloured bits are um, bits that slip during a hypothetical earthquake event, which actually looks quite a bit like the Japan 2011 event. And so then this slip on the, on the fault plane would cause some vertical displacement that might look something like this. So the typical story is you'll have uplift on the oceanic side and um, some subsidence on the other side. And that's what initiates your tsunami. So once you've got that uplift, basically then uh, it just generates a wave which propagates throughout the ocean. So it'll look something like this. You can see that initially you've got sort of a fairly well-defined front which is just hitting South America at the moment and reflecting off. But because of interactions with topography and reflection off land and so on, you end up with these really complex um, wave trains that persist in the ocean for, say, a couple of days until they're dissipated by friction in the nearshore areas. Often in areas that receive that sort of first front, 
often that will be the largest wave that you see. But elsewhere, you may well get the biggest waves occurring, you know, a day after or whatever, l later on, due to the interactions of all these waves that are bouncing around the ocean. Actually, for this event, um, the biggest waves in parts of New Zealand and parts of Australia happened sort of a day or two days after the earthquake um, because of this reflection from South America, actually, which went back and contributed to the waves that were already there. OK, so that's the, the large-scale oceanic behaviour. Near the coast, the, the reason that these things are hazardous is that the wave height tends to increase. So some kind of heuristic that you might use for that is, say, if you have a tsunami that's about one metre high in four, metre, four kilometres of ocean depth, OK, so that's like a typical ocean depth, then if you propagated that into 50 metres of depth, that it'll maybe be about three metres high. Roughly, it depends on the topography and all these other things. Then if you take that onto shore, you know, you're probably going to be looking at some areas that might have run-up of over 10 metres, other areas less. It depends a lot on the, the details of the topography. But we can try to understand how this is going to work by inundation modelling, so something like what you see in the pictures in this figure. And so that's really important information for risk management, right? People want to know which areas might get wet in hypothetical tsunami events. So these models, uh, this is very routine to set up and run these models. We do this, um, uh, people all over the world run these things. And so they're normally developed at sort of city spatial scales. I guess you're talking tens of kilometres of coastline, that sort of thing. Um, the reason that they're normally developed at those kind of scales is you need high resolution elevation data. Okay, the results are sensitive to, those, um, to that and we don't currently have seamless high resolution bathymetry topography everywhere. They're also kind of time consuming to set up and test, okay? You, you're probably merging a few different elevation data sets and then finding, oh yeah, this one's dodgy here, we have to replace it with something else and so on. So there's a bit of manual intervention involved. They can also be computationally heavy. There's a, a great strides being made in this area, but it, you know, it wouldn't be unusual to run these things on uh, dozens or a few hundred cores for a few hours to, to do a single scenario. It really depends on the, the, the size of the area and the resolution. But so it would be really cool to do some kind of Australia-wide inundation model someday, but, but not yet. Um, and that uh, really shapes the way that we approach the hazard assessment that we'll see later on. So now if I could just talk a bit about tsunami observations in Australia. Probably most people think that Australia doesn't have much of a hazard, and certainly compared to living in somewhere like eastern Japan or Chile, right on top of a subduction zone, we don't, OK? Or, you know, southern Indonesia too. Um, it, it's much better to be in a sort of a middle of a tectonic plate like Australia is. But we have actually observed quite a few tsunamis historically. So this is a database um, that's been developed by a whole bunch of people, the, the Australian Tsunami Database. Um, and it just is showing the number of uh, tsunamis that have been observed in different states. And most of these are historical, OK, what you see in the, the bottom right there. The records, as you would expect, as you go back in history, they become less reliable and less frequent. Um, since the 50s or so, they get pretty good where there's a lot more instrumentation. And so some of these events too are quite speculative. You know, they might not, they won't all be tsunamis, but they're included in the database so people can do future work if they need to. So you can see that basically for the ones that have known causes, most of these events are, are caused by earthquakes. And we also have the, the next biggest cause is actually unknown, okay, just because the historical records are not fantastic. All right, there's also um, some suggestion of paleo tsunami deposits in Australia. So if you go to the Western Australian coast, um, sort of the central to northwestern Australian coast, the, the place seems to be littered with marine inundation deposits at all different elevations. This is a study from 2014 by Dodson et al, where they just went around in about 200k around the Dampier area and um, identified all these different deposits with uh, elevation up to 12 metres above sea level. Now, that area also gets hit by big storm surges now and again, okay? So some of these might be from storm surges, but the authors suggested that they thought some of the bigger ones were more likely to be from tsunamis. If you go onto the east coast, um, there's a, a couple of possible tsunami deposits around New South Wales, and there's also been suggestion of correlations between these and other deposits all throughout the, the South Pacific and uh, New Zealand as well. 
there's papers also looking at um, or reporting unusual marine incursions in estuarine deposits in New South Wales and in Tasmania and suggesting that these might be caused by tsunamis. With, with all this stuff, uh, a challenge is that it, with paleo tsunami work, it can be hard to distinguish between deposits produced by tsunamis and deposits produced by storm surges. It's just a, a challenge everyone faces everywhere. Uh, and in general, interpretations can be difficult or open to question. So there's a large body of work suggesting um, mega tsunami had occurred in New South Wales and were responsible for a whole heap of different coastal landforms. That's um, quite widely disputed, I suppose, and there's, there's papers looking at that. So sometimes the interpretations uh, are open to, to question. And uh, yeah, that's just the challenge when you're looking at you know, sedimentary records of these things. It's not always straightforward. It's a little easier then to look at events that are observed in the historical period. This is um, down the bottom left there, you see a, an animation or a, a snapshot of maximum water surface of the uh, tsunami caused by the 1960 Chile earthquake. Okay, that had magnitude about 9.5. It's the biggest instrumentally recorded earthquake. And um, that made a really big tsunami throughout the Pacific. In Australia, it was widely observed in the East Coast. Um, but not really too dangerous. Uh, mostly marine impacts, a little bit of inundation, some reports of people getting into trouble, fishermen or kids playing at the coast. But uh, to my knowledge, no one died or there were no bad injuries. There were um, a reasonable amount of damages, um, reports of boats sunk, um, uh, significant damages to the oyster industry, okay, I guess due to the um, stirring up of the estuaries. And so the reason, though, that uh, we were kind of lucky because the reason that, you know, it, it wasn't too bad in Australia, as you can see down the, the bottom left, that, well, the, the tsunami waveform just wasn't too well oriented to go to our coast. So there were far field deaths, uh, d deaths at great distance from the earthquake source due to this event. So 142 people in Japan, right? That's about as far away as you can go via the ocean. And 61 in Hawaii, they had run up up to 10 metres there. It's a, a well-known event in the region. So it's not that um, you're safe if you're far away, it's that, uh, well in this case, we were, we were lucky it wasn't pointing at us. If we look at the um, uh, Sumatra Andaman event in 2004, okay, so the Indian Ocean tsunami, again, it wasn't too bad for Australia, there's sort of one metre plus waves in Western Australia, uh, a bit of minor inundation, a whole bunch of ocean rescues, um, and some damages to marinas and boats. Again, we were lucky most of the energy was not directed toward Australia. So if you look near to source in Arche, the, the maximum surveyed run up from surveys that I'm aware there is actually above 50 metres on some coastal cliffs. That was quite isolated, but there was widespread run up of say 20 to 30 metres. And you know, I think, I forget the exact number, maybe it's around 150,000 people died in that region. Um, as you went out, also, there were tens of thousands of people killed in the Sri Lanka and southern India, that sort of area. If you go further afield, though, um, the tsunami also reached uh, Somalia and Oman, and uh, 300 people died in Somalia. It had uh, run up up to about nine metres um, and quite a lot of places above five metres. Also, uh, I think people wouldn't have received a warning about it, so there were quite a few deaths there. So it's actually a similar distance to Perth if you think about it. But it, it's just that the earthquake wasn't well oriented to send the energy that way, which is great. So just because you've got some distance, it doesn't mean you're safe if you're unlucky enough to be in the path of the wave energy. Okay, so this event is interesting. It's quite significant for Australia. It was a magnitude 7.7, .7, so quite a bit smaller than uh, the previous events I looked at in terms of the earthquake magnitude. Caused a quite devastating tsunami in southern Indonesia, I think, yeah, killed hundreds of people. Widespread waves above five metres, a uh, maximum of 20 metres in a, a particular locale. And interestingly enough, this actually was also responsible for the largest confirmed tsunami run-up in Australia, which is 7.9 metres at a place called Steep Point in Western Australia. It's kind of about the, the westernmost place you could get on the mainland in Western Australia, near Shark Bay. So um, after the tsunami happened, this was surveyed by Geoscience Australia. Amy Prendergast at the time worked here. She's at Melbourne Uni now. And um, she led a team out to do some surveys. The event uh, inundated some campsites where there were actually people with sort of knee-high through to waist-high inundation. And so they, they fled 
inland uh, after the first wave came. I think there are about three waves. Uh, yeah, and so again, this highlights that um, if, if you're in a, a bad location, uh, you can still receive significant waves even if the earthquake's not necessarily big, okay? So it's not just a question of the earthquake magnitude, but very much where you're located. And then, of course, the Japan tsunami. So you can see it's, it's really um, not at all well-oriented to affect Australia. So in southeast Australia, we had around 30 centimetre wave amplitudes. I'm not aware of any significant inundation. Um, there were some people got into trouble. So swimmers at Marimbula were um, uh, reportedly washed into a, into a lagoon. The entrance there has some pretty significant currents anyway, I understand. And um, with the tsunami, you get some sort of high, higher frequency oscillations. The currents can get quite fast. So there were various reports of problems, but it wasn't too bad. Still, though, it, this event reinforces that fact that if you're unlucky and far away, you can suffer significant run-up. So there was five metres in the Galapagos Islands. Okie dokie. So the summary is, I guess, that dozens of tsunamis have been observed in Australia. Uh, they're mostly earthquake-generated or unknown sources. There's also possible paleo-tsunami deposits, and there's you know, challenges interpreting those. Historically, we've seen a bunch of events. The impacts haven't been catastrophic, so why is that? Well, um, it's great that we're not located very close to major subduction zones. Without a doubt, that's a better place to be than being right on top of them. But it's only part of the story. There's uh, repeated instances where tsunamis had major impacts at far field sites. And so I guess the other part of the story is that these historical large magnitude earthquakes that we've had, they haven't been well in oriented to create tsunamis that strongly impact Australia. So, but uh, hypothetically, it could happen. We've seen smaller events that have been well oriented, like that Java uh, event. And um, if we saw a, a much bigger earthquake in that area, then probably the impacts in Western Australia would be much more significant. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview of tsunamis in Australia and how tsunamis are generated. So next, I'm going to talk to you about the 2018 Australian Probabilistic Tsunami Hazard Assessment, which is a project we've been working on at GA for, um, for a few years and released uh, late last year. OK, so I'm going to often use the word PTHA, and that is um, uh, a shorthand for Probabilistic Tsunami Hazard Assessment. OK, so, so why do we uh, have a PTHA for Australia? So basically, there's demand for tsunami hazard information. People are interested to know which areas might get wet if we had an unfortunately placed earthquake. And that's useful for emergency management planning, you know, running exercises for the state emergency services and so on. Um, for land use planning, maybe for pricing insurance. And what's of interest for the purposes, uh, for, for applied purposes, is really, uh, for the most part, the onshore and nearshore impacts. So which area is going to be inundated? How deep might it be? And also questions like, uh, will there be unusual currents? Where will those be? How, th how might they affect marine users? Now, the way in which that's assessed, and these studies are done all the time, is people would combine nearshore hydrodynamic models, the high-resolution stuff like I showed earlier, with offshore scenarios. So, you know, hypothetical magnitude 9.2 on the Kermadec Tonga Trench in a particular place, or these kind of things. A challenge for these studies is that Models of um, hypothetical tsunami scenarios and also any associated return periods with those, ideas of how often they might happen, the whole area is not at all standardised and it suffers from very large uncertainties that we'll look at a bit later. So you end up with a really big variation of uh, approaches to scenario design and then a really big variation in onshore results and it becomes very hard to compare studies. So this is not just a problem if you're actually doing these studies but also if you're an emergency manager wanting to commission some of this work to inform your evacuation zones or something like that, you, you want to be able to compare work that you've done in different areas or work that's been done over time and understand why it's changing or what the causes of the differences are. It's difficult without some sort of standardised um, uh, resource of scenarios and return periods. So that's what we provide with the Australian PTHA. We basically give a nationally consistent treatment of the offshore part of the problem. Okay, so how big are these tsunamis going to be in the ocean adjacent to your coastline and how often do they occur? We can't do the inundation modelling everywhere like I talked about earlier, but people can set that up on a case-by-case -case basis and use our scenarios to drive their hazard assessments.
Okay, so the PGHA is one of the core products that we develop at Geoscience Australia to help understand tsunami hazards, and that's really crucial to informing the advice that we give to government as well. So one of the things that GA does is we're a member of the Australian Tsunami Advisory Group, so this is a uh, reference group for the Australian-New Zealand Emergency Management Committee, part of the machinery of government that thinks about um, uh, bad natural disasters and what we might do about them. And this includes people from all sorts of agencies that to some extent have some responsibility for managing tsunami hazards or dealing with the events. And in all cases, this would be kind of a minor part of what those agencies do. So you're talking about the all the state emergency services. Um, Surf Life Saving Australia is also on there. Um, representatives of offshore territories. So basically, ATAG gives these groups a way to get together talk about what they're doing in terms of managing tsunami hazard and tsunami risk, share experiences, uh, learn about what works and what doesn't. And Geoscience Australia uh, contributes to this by providing advice about tsunami hazard and early warning. Also, the Bureau uh, contributes uh, with that. Obviously, we jointly do the tsunami early warning system with them. Now, I'm just going to talk about what the PTHA provides. And then after that, I'll explain the scientific basis for all of this. The core thing that the PTHA provides is more than a million hypothetical earthquake tsunami scenarios modelled in deep water. And the purpose of these is forcing inundation models. So to facilitate people doing that, we provide all these scenarios and we store the results at around 20,000 sites offshore of, of Australia. So we, we model the tsunamis for about 36 hours and store them at all these sites. And then people can go to those sites and if they're interested in a given scenario, they can download the wave time series and use that as a boundary condition for a, a nearshore inundation model. We also provide the initial water surface deformation. So um, that's good. For example, if people wanted to use um, a, a different hydrodynamic model to represent propagation in the ocean, something like that, they could do that because we're giving them the source. So um, yeah, so it, this just makes the, it a bit more flexible. What we also do is at all those offshore points, we provide estimates of how often a tsunami above a given height would occur. And so this means that you can do things like say, OK, um, I'm interested in a study somewhere near Sydney, something like that. I'll take an offshore point there, and I'll look at what a 1 in 500 year wave height is, and I'll base my scenarios around that. Okay, And that's the kind of thing that is nice to report if you're doing a, an inundation hazard study. People want that kind of information. We also provide quantified uncertainties on those, and the uncertainties tend to be very large because of limitations in our current knowledge of how often really big earthquakes happen. I'll talk about that a bit more later. Another thing that you'd want to know is um, where you might want to place your hypothetical earthquake scenario if you're doing an inundation study. And so we provide this sort of called de-aggregation information. So you can ask yourself, where might a uh, at my particular site of interest, so the red dot there somewhere offshore Sydney, where might a, a 1 in 500 year tsunami originate from? And this kind of gives you a visual depiction and you can see that, okay, um, in the middle of the Kermadec Tonga Trench there, um, just north of New Zealand, is kind of high and there's significant stuff in South America and parts of Poisega. So this is useful for citing scenarios. And we can summarise that information in other ways, just like here, just looking at the source zones as a whole. OK, so a summary of what we provide is basically uh, more than a million scenarios like this. We don't store them everywhere because it's uh, too much file storage. We store them at about 20,000 points. And they all have uh, return period information tied to them. And then people can use that to force their more detailed inundation models, OK, like we depict here. You zoom in enough, and you use high enough resolution elevation data, and you start simulating inundation. OK, so that's what we provide. And now I'm just going to talk for a while about what the basis for that is, how we do it, and how it is tested. So all of the PTHA 18 scenarios originate from earthquakes. The earthquake sources we have are depicted here. Um, most of those are on global subduction zones. And then we add more detail near Australia for sources that might generate smaller earthquakes, but that could be significant enough because we're nearby. Um, the the near, uh, near Australia schematisation was uh, mainly developed by Jonathan Griffin, who's now doing a PhD at Otago. 
we don't include things like landslide sources or local earthquakes. Um, they, landslides could make a tsunami in Australia. It's maybe something we'd want to add in future. For now, there's a bunch of practical reasons that we just have the distant earthquake sources. Now, okay, on each of these earthquake source zones, what we do is we represent the 3D fault plane geometry, okay? So, if, for example, in most places, that's that subduction interface that I showed you earlier. There's various products around that, that image um, those fault geometries, and ma we make use of them. Then what we do is we use it to define, to, to discretize our source zones, and we break them up into these approximately 50 by 50 kilometer little pieces of the fault. Now, all of our earthquakes will be represented as some combinations of those little pieces. And I'm going to show you the earthquake scenarios next. Basically, on any given source zone, we'd have thousands or tens of thousands of earthquake scenarios. OK, so how should we make earthquake scenarios? So this is a challenging question. This is where you start to hit um, new science, I suppose. So historically, a way that we've often done this would be to um, uh, approximate the earthquake as having constant slip everywhere, something like you see in this picture here, and estimate the area based on the magnitude using some statistical results in the literature that basically say bigger magnitude earthquakes tend to be larger and there's some equations you can use to approximate that. And then we would just move those all around the fault plane. You might see that's actually a very slow animation and slowly the location of that earthquake is shifting around the, the source. So there's some question about whether this is an adequate method for simulating tsunamis. Certainly, close to the source, it's well established that it isn't. Those variations in the slip matter quite a bit. So, another thing that we did then is test a different set of scenarios where we still have this constant slip, but the size varies. So, if you look at that literature that um, estimates the relationship between earthquake area and magnitude, there's actually a great deal of variability. Some earthquakes are compact for their magnitude with high slip, and some earthquakes are more spread out. Um, classic examples are the 2004, the Sumatra Andaman earthquake caused the Indian Ocean tsunami, it was really long, like 1,400 kilometres uh, for a, about a magnitude in the low nines. The, uh, the Japan earthquake in 2011 was quite compact, maybe only most of the slip in 400 or, or so kilometres. So their size varies a lot, and we represent that with these variable area uniform slip scenarios. Then we also have another set of scenarios where it's got that area variation, but it all, we also model slip heterogeneity. So the model of slip heterogeneity is based on some work we published a few years ago using some models and fitting them to finite fault inversion, so estimates of the slip heterogeneity of real earthquakes. A priori, we don't know which of these is going to work or whether any of them is going to work, so I'm going to test that and report to you later on. But basically then for each of our earthquake scenarios, we model the resulting tsunami. We do this with a set of equations called the linear shallow water equations with Coriolis. Basically, we, we model the tsunami on a one-by-one one arc-minute grid, so that it's uh, cells of about 1.8 by 1.8 kilometres. So that's um, certainly good enough to model tsunamis in the deep ocean, but it's not good enough to take them on shore. Okay? So we have a, kind of a model with nearly global extents. It's east-west periodic, uh, but we, we chop off Antarctica and we chop off some things in the north that are not important for Australia. And we run them for 36 hours, and... That takes about 20 CPU core hours per unit source. And so we couldn't do this work really without the NCI or some comparable uh, high performance computing resource. Um, you know, we have uh, 4,000, more than 4,000 unit sources here. So it, it's getting reasonably heavy. You need access to, to HPC. Now, importantly, we actually only model one tsunami per unit source. Remember those little elementary pieces of fault that I showed you earlier? What we'll do is actually uh, make up all our tsunamis based on those. So we store the results at hazard points. I mentioned before we can't store them everywhere. They're chosen largely to support inundation models for Australia, and it includes our offshore territories. Uh, Antarctica too, not depicted here. We also store some global points, which helps us do testing, but they're at lower density. You'll see some of that testing in a minute. And then basically what we do is we create wave time series for all these scenarios by combining the unit source tsunami models. So essentially, there's this really nice property of the equations we're using to model this tsunami. Um, 
which means that this, it's mathematically exact. So even if we have more than a million tsunami scenarios, we can just do 4,000 odd tsunami propagation models and then cheaply create the tsunamis for all those scenarios in a mathematically exact way. So that's nice. This picture here is just depicting a bunch of those scenarios in the vicinity of the 2011 Japan earthquake. And actually those blue lines are observations at uh, dart buoys. The, the top left one is right near the source. It's that black point in the, the other panel. The bottom one's on the other side of the Pacific Ocean near the Galapagos Islands. And so you can see how the tsunami is affected here by these variations in slip um, that we see in these scenarios. And so what our testing is going to have to think about is, you know, are these realistic? But the great thing about the, the unit source summation is that it becomes feasible to simulate many, many scenarios. Okay, so now testing. What do we want? So we're proposing these scenarios for people to use for hazard studies. So a, a kind of minimum requirement that you would want is, well, we, we better produce tsunamis that actually look like historical events, right? If we can't do that, then uh, maybe we should look back and try and model them a bit, a bit better. But there, there's another aspect to it, which is also super important. We are modeling, um, we're proposing all these families of scenarios, right? And we would want the, uh, ideally, observations should look like a randomly drawn model scenario with a similar location and magnitude, right? So if we were really properly representing the variability in tsunamis caused by different size and maybe different slip and so on, um, you would want the observations to look as though they were just drawn randomly. Otherwise, we'd have some bias in our stochastic models, okay, which would bias hazard assessments. So we don't want that. We need to test that. So here's how we test it. Since about the mid-2000s, there's been uh, a really great global network of deep ocean gauges designed for measuring tsunamis. They are the purple points and numbers that you see in this figure. What we did is that we looked at big earthquakes magnitude above 7.7 .7 since 2006 that had generated a tsunami that was measured at these sites. And um, there, we pulled out 18 events in the end um, with things that we could actually uh, see the tsunami. So their, their locations are depicted here, and we're going to use this as a test data set. Okay, so let me give you an example of this. So let's think about the Japan tsunami in 2011, okay, the, the Tohoku tsunami. So that's the best recorded event we have. It was recorded at 28 dart buoys globally, 28 of these deep ocean sites. Uh, I think there's seven depicted here in this figure, in the, in the black line. I'll show you some of the rest a bit later. And so we can think about that, if, okay, if you think the Tohoku tsunami is something around magnitude 9.1, it occurred in that location offshore of Japan, something around there. So you can imagine then the PTHA provides some kind of corresponding family of scenarios um, with similar location and magnitude, okay? And so we would want, in some sense, that family of scenarios to, uh, contain something that looks like the Tohoku event, and we'd want, ideally, events like Tohoku and others to seem like consistent with just random draws from those scenarios. So the, the simplest thing you can ask is just, are there any scenarios similar to the observations? It might be a little hard to see, but in the right-hand side figure, I've got uh, a red line and a green line and a blue line. And so they correspond to the best scenarios with similar location and magnitude that were generated by, for red, it's the heterogeneous slip model with all that slip variability. For green, it's the uniform slip model where the size varied randomly. And for blue, it's the uniform slip model where the size was fixed and just a function of magnitude. What you can kind of see is that, in this case, both the red and the green lines show a re reasonable match to the observed data, okay? So that means that at least we generated one scenario that looked like the observations. The blue line doesn't, okay? So, and this is the best scenario of that type. So you just can't model this earthquake well with a fixed area uniform slip scenario the way that we've done it. So it's right there, that's some um, good information on the kinds of scenarios we might want. Here's just a depiction of all the 28 dart buoys and our best heterogeneous slip scenario. So these are all, all around the Pacific Ocean, and uh, to me, it looks pretty good. Uh, you've got to remember, I'm not tuning this scenario to match the observations. I'm just generating them randomly and then whipping out one that looks close to it. So, yeah, we can make things that look like this tsunami. That's great. So we repeated this for 18 different test events, okay? What do we find? 
basically the heterogeneous slip model and the model with uniform slip but where the size varies, they perform about equally well in terms of being able to produce some scenarios that are similar to the observations we see in the deep ocean. Uh, a bunch of those are depicted here. I can't depict all the 18 events and I won't try in this slide. Um, for, however, the fixed area uniform slip model, uh, in the Toku example I showed you, it really didn't perform very well. And it turns out that sometimes it works well and just sometimes it's terrible. Okay, so beware. Um, I would be very cautious about doing tsunami hazard work and using these kinds of scenarios. You could get it very wrong. Okay, so that was just looking at best fit scenarios, but we're also interested in statistical biases. So one thing we do here is uh, this plot uh, uh, in the left is depicting basically uh, magnitude on the x-axis and maximum slip on the y-axis for all of our um, model scenarios that were, had similar location and magnitude to one of those observed events. And in red, I'm depicting the values for the best three scenarios, okay? So the ones that uh, looked pretty similar to observations. And to me, uh, it kind of looks like those red points are just sort of scattering in a similar way to the black points. You can do statistics on this and it says a similar thing. So that's good. It's suggesting that, you know, from this test, we're not seeing really strong biases in this heterogeneous slip model. But if you look at the, the uniform slip model that has variable size, very interesting result. What happens is that most of those red points there uh, plot above the green line in this plot, okay? That green line is giving you the median of all our random scenarios. And so what it means is that the scenarios that fit the observations well, they most often had high slip, okay? And they were compact relative to those random scenarios we produced. So it's indicating a bias in this model, okay? Our model's generating too many large area low slip scenarios relative to what we see in the tsunamis at the 18 dart buoys. So we did something else as well. We looked directly at wave heights, um, at the at basically the range of the tsunami at all those dart buoys. And so our model, we have this corresponding family of scenarios with similar location and magnitude for all the events. And what we want is that the statistical properties of those are reasonable, okay? So a definition of reasonable is that the observations look like you plucked one scenario at random from each of those, for each of those 18 events. So ideally, yeah, the, the, the model would define the probability of having tsunamis that were big or small or whatever in that location with that magnitude. It's the best model you could have. And so we can use this idea to develop statistical methods to test our models. Okay, and so this means you can test for statistical biases in wave heights and so on. I'm not going to talk about the technical stuff just today. We've had a paper on this that's gone online. It's in JGI. And um, what we found is that those heterogeneous slip models, they don't have obvious bias. The, the, the scatter seems about right. It's not too high or too low. For both of the uniform slip models, they make too many small tsunamis. Like what I showed you before where our good fitting uniform slip scenarios tended to have small area and high slip. That's because they make, you can make a bigger tsunami like that as it turns out. And when we just look at the wave heights too, we find that those models are making too many small tsunamis. Nature doesn't randomly behave like that. So that's great. We know there's some bias. And in the, in the case of the variable area uniform slip model, the one in the middle, we find that it's got some, we can model scenarios pretty well, but there's a bias towards compact um, uh, high slip events. So we can bias adjust these, actually. We can say, um, or g give preference to using those compact scenarios, and it can work quite well. The heterogeneous slip scenarios, they seem pretty good according to our testing. The uniform slip scenarios with fixed area, we suggest to avoid them, okay? So then, you know, maybe we should never have made them, but we didn't know this a priori, right? So this is part of the testing we did for this study. So that's, that's an overview of the scenario testing we did. Um, the other thing we need to do for a PTHA is model how often these events occur. Now, in our case, that's basically we do that by modeling the earthquake frequencies. And we constrain them with historical earthquake data and also with information on plate tectonics, how quickly the plates are converging. And, um, yeah, do some statistics on that that I'll, I'll show you. Basically, the, the idea here is we... Initially, we just look at earthquakes on a per-source per zone basis. And we assume that on these source zones, the, the um, frequency of earthquakes with different magnitudes follows some kind of Gutenberg-Richter type relation. Basically, what that says is that, for example, 
for every magnitude 7 you have, you'll have 10 magnitude 6s and uh, 0.1 magnitude 8s and 1 in, 1 in 100 magnitude 9s. So it's a relation between how often earthquakes occur and their magnitude. Smaller magnitude earthquakes occur more often. That number I said then, 10 or 100 or whatever, uh, that number might not be exactly right. There are coefficients in the model that can give you different ratios, but it's this general idea of a, a decrease in the number of earthquakes in proportion to the magnitude. These relations, uh, a priori, they're subject to a number of very uncertain parameters, like how big a magnitude earthquake you could have on your source zone, how much of the plate convergence is taken up by earthquake so-called coupling, uh, and the, the B value that determines the ratios of numbers of small and large earthquakes. And what we do is we take prior ranges of these parameters from uh, uh, the GEM faulted Earth database or some uh, modifications of that, basically. So things that are based on literature and expert opinion and uh, the ranges are not very informative to start with, very wide ranges. Then we can further constrain these by the requirements that the... Um, the frequency of earthquakes balances some fraction of the tectonic plate convergence. Okay, so there's, we have information in the bottom right here on how rapidly the tectonic plates in different places are converging relative to each other. And that gives us some kind of upper bound on the frequency of really big earthquakes because basically um, if they happen too often, the slip would cause the plates to be converging more rapidly, right? So it gives you some kind of bounds there. And then of course we use earthquake observations. So before we use the earthquake observations, this is a depiction of what our model would look like. So all those grey curves, are there's about 32,000 curves per source zone representing the uncertainties in basically how you might have a Gutenberg-Richter relation that would satisfy these constraints of seismic moment conservation and the prior param parameter ranges that we specified. And that will often agree very poorly with data, okay, because we haven't... Um, imposed really heavy constraints and have very large uncertainty. So that's a, that's a logarithmic scale in the y-axis there, right? So very wide range, more than 100 times in the, the frequency of these things. And what we do is then we take the earthquake catalogue data, which is depicted in green there, and we each of these models, these 32,000 models, would have a prior weight. We use the data to update those weights using Bayes' theorem, okay, which is a, a, a standard approach of doing statistics. And once you do that, then you get models that agree quite well with historical data. You also still have very large uncertainties at high magnitudes, and that's realistic. On, on a lot of source zones, we don't know whether really large magnitude earthquakes can occur or how often. Okay? The, the exception is, I mean, we know on Chile we could have a 9.5 because we've seen one. But what about in a place like Kermadec Tonga where the largest that we've seen is in the low magnitude 8s? but the fault is really big, and in theory we could squeeze a 9 or even bigger onto it. There we have very big uncertainties in maximum magnitudes, and those are quantified in our analysis in a way that is still consistent with the historical data and with plate tectonics. So then what we do is we, we do these kind of analyses for each source zone, and then essentially we chop up those exceedance rates and we smear them over our scenarios. And we do that in a way that respects spatial variations in plate convergence. So this is an example of Kermadec Tonga. It's converging really fast up in the north and slower down in the south. And our methods of sort of smearing those rates over scenarios respect that. OK, so does it work? So uh, there's a whole bunch of ways you can test these kind of things. One way is just to uh, combine all your earthquake catalog data on all your source zones and then combine all your modelled earthquake rates on all your sources and see if they agree OK. And so this is depicting that here where the model is in the, uh, the black with the circles and the, the data is in the red. And you can see they agree pretty well, right, which is reassuring. They don't agree exactly because we don't force them to and uh, the modelled rate will also be affected by our uncertainties in uh, things that are badly constrained like how often large magnitude earthquakes occur in some places. But that, that's reassuring. You can also do site-specific testing. So you can go down to a particular location, maybe where there's some great paleoseismic data or something, and do comparisons of what we predict versus other published results. We've done that for about eight different places in the PTHA report. I'm not going to discuss it here, but uh, it, it's looking pretty good. All right, so now let's just have a quick look at the hazard results. So. Once you have rates for all those scenarios, you can add them up and start talking about how often you would have a wave exceeding some height 
anywhere around Australia. So this here is depicting the maximum stage, so the, max, the, the maximum that the tsunami reaches at a, a 1 in 500 year event, so an average return interval of 500 years. So it doesn't happen every 500 years, but on average, if you look at a long time period, on average you've got one event every 500 years. Now this, as it stands, you can see that there's uh, higher values in the northwest, and more generally, high values are close to the coast and, and lower far away. That's because of wave shoaling, okay? So just like at the beach, tsunamis get into shallow water, they get higher. And that makes this kind of hard to interpret visually. So a better way to look at it is to approximately normalise everything to a depth of 100 metres. So this is approximate only, but you can see it really removes most of that variation along shore. And so now um, this uh, gives you kind of a better indication of the, the size when, because you, visually you, you can't see what the depth is, so you can't know how to interpret wave shoaling. So basically we see that in the northwest, we've, we're predicting the, the highest hazard, at least in terms of these offshore wave heights. I mean, if you're at a site onshore where there were high cliffs, maybe you don't care, right? So it also depends on what's happening onshore. But in terms of the offshore scenarios, uh, it's got high exposure. And the reason for that is because of the Sunda Arc. It's near the eastern Sunda Arc, that big subduction zone that runs under Indonesia. We also have sort of intermediate level hazard on the, uh, the, the southwest coast and the east coast. And so on the southwest, that's also because of exposure to the Sunda Arc. On the east coast, it's because of a whole bunch of sources, Kermadec Tonga, Persica, South America, uh, New Hebrides, Solomons. Now there are large uncertainties in these. I, I talked about how for many of these source zones we just don't really know how big the earthquakes can be and so then inevitably there's large uncertainties when you talk about how often they occur, right? We can quantify those and have a look at how they affect our interpretation of how big these offshore waves would be in a certain return period. And we provide that information. And yeah, so you can see th these are uh, 16th and 84th percentiles, some Bayesian description of the uncertainties basically at this point. And yeah, there's often, you know, say a factor of two variation in these things. But that shouldn't be surprising given our current rate of knowledge of how often big earthquakes occur. Okay, so how to get the results. Everything's freely available on NCI threads. Um, also the code is on GitHub. Um, and so all these products that I talked about before, you can get them. Um, some of them, you, you know, you're interfacing with maybe hundreds of files and getting subsets of. We provide scripts to do that, but users are going to have to uh, basically copy and paste our scripts and change some numbers to do it. So you have to use a little bit of code to do it. And we provide all those codes and tutorials on how to do it, which are available at this web address here. Okay, so the conclusions are, important thing, look, tsunamis can be dangerous even far from the source. Um, large earthquakes in the wrong location could produce hazardous waves in Australia. We, we haven't had uh, big disasters thus far on the mainland, but um, you, you could have some bad events like that we've seen historically uh, in, in other locations that were far from the source, if the earthquake was well oriented to do that. The PTHA 18 gives a nationally consistent basis for inundation hazard assessments. Uh, basically, we're providing over a million earthquake tsunami scenarios with return periods for distant earthquakes. It's had substantial testing at dart buoys, okay? More testing than uh, other, stu other comparable studies I'm aware of, and definitely more testing than most practitioners who wanted to do some site-specific study would be able to do. So that's, that's good. The event frequencies remain uncertain, okay? We can't solve fundamental questions uh, in earthquake science to do with how often magnitude nines occur in anywhere. It's well known to be a difficult problem. But we do represent the uncertainties uh, in regards of this in ways that are consistent with plate tectonics and historical earthquakes. And we provide that information to end users so they can make their own decisions about how to deal with it. And that is all. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>